Live broadcasts are available only in Reading due to technology constraints. Uh, but the meeting was videotaped for distribution to television stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discussion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions or comments be directed to the chair and that all parties act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order in all public comment or ensuing discussion. Um, some introductions. First, we'd like to introduce the new cab member from North Reading, Mark Crisos. Hello. Hello, Mark. Hi. Welcome Hi. to the board. Thank you for uh, your service. Mm -hmm. And um, and also, w jumping ahead a bit, we have a new uh, commissioner, Dave Hennessy. After many months of waiting, uh, we finally got it done. Thanks, mm -hmm. Dave, for stepping up and. You're and welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, and so is there anybody, is this about the, if anybody in attendance has any comments, would that be from Mark or from anybody else? Um, Public anybody comment? No? Anybody else wishing to be acknowledged? Okay. John will be, uh, Stempek will be board secretary. Is that okay, John? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Okay. Dave, we've introduced you. Now we have minutes to approve uh, the October 2 minutes. I move the October 2nd, 2014 minutes be accepted as uh, presented. Second. Second. All in favor? And that is a 5 0 vote. Next time, Dave, right hand. Mm. Yeah. Charter says right hand. Charter says right hand for some reason. <laughs> Vestigial <laughs> to <laughs> Puritan <laughs> days. <laughs> I think the left hand that, belongs that to the devil. <laughs> that in him means her, and her means him. Exactly. <laughs> uh, the motion carried 5-0-0. Uh, General Manager's report. Okay, good evening. Thank you. Um, I want to start off with just a little feedback from some of our uh, storms. Uh, the new nickname is Snow Snowpocalypse, as I heard <laughs> what we're oh, having no. here. Um, we had back-to-back -back storms for a while, and uh, we actually had really no outages. We had um, uh, the team was ready to go uh, in anticipation of, of it turning wet and getting heavy, but we managed to get through the majority of those first storms without any outages whatsoever. So I wanted to thank staff for being um, uh, ready to go. Uh, this most recent... Um, uh, storm though as the ice dam started and the icicles started uh, we did get several of um, the ice dams icicles breaking off and breaking SE cables and meter meters off of the house so we've had um, some of those occurring um, and I know this isn't electrical but I would like to remind the folks out there that if you have natural gas there's vents on your gas meter you should make sure that you um, dig them out. If you have septic, you have um, methane discharge pipes, you should shovel those out. Um, you know, gas dryers, electric dryers, um, you know, sometimes when you're having problems with your house, you're not thinking about all these things that could be backfeeding into the house. And um, we've actually dug some things out here where there was some gas fumes um, over in the line operations area. I think the regulation for the gas from your furnace, uh, if you have a gas furnace, is something like three feet. And it has to be, when it comes off the wall, it has to be at least three feet off the ground. Yeah. Unfortunately, the snow was about six feet. <laughs> <laughs> so right. we have to dig it out. The bathroom vents that are on your roof, a lot of those are um, blocked in as well. So, so it's vent check time. Um, okay, the items B through F, um, I'm going to... Um, uh, start the presentation and then I'm going to ask uh, Tom Olilla who's one of our pretty recent hires. He was an integrated resource engineer uh, for the um, integrated resources division and he's going to talk about um, our new demand response program in Tangent and I apologize to Mark Crisos because he heard a, a little bit of this at okay. the CAB meeting <laughs> um, but we promise it won't be completely redundant <laughs> and then Bill Selden will um, step in for Jane who's on vacation and handle um, uh, the competitive elect electricity uh, topics and then Hamid Jafari our director of engineering and operations will handle um, that that section of it and in that we will target 
um, C, D, E, and then we'll wrap it up with F, if that's okay with everyone. Okay. You insist I have a pointer. Yes. Okay. Um, can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, I'll stand over here. Not over here, over here. So, um, can we back up one, just for a second? I'm sorry. So the reason why I, we titled this uh, is that there was a 2008 strategic plan. In a strategic plan, when we start to do the organizational study and the reliability study, it almost becomes a chicken and an egg. It's like you start off with a reliability study, we'll look at the organization reliability results and recommendations, and then we'll, we'll revise the strategic plan, and then we'll lay out the 20-year plan in the goals, okay? So this is really uh, what we've been doing in-house and how we're laying out. We're not waiting for the consultant to come in. We, we, we have to work every day to, to move forward. The consultant is reviewing some of the stuff that we're putting together along with other things that they're evaluating for their recommendation. So um, I just want to bring attention to the strategic plan from 2008. I'm sure a lot of people in here have read it, but if you're new and you haven't seen it, we can have Jeannie send your copy. Okay. The mission statement is RMLD is committed to providing excellent customer service, including competitively priced electricity as a result of diligence in the areas of power supply risk management, system reliability and flexibility, as well as overall busi business efficiency. Next. Okay. So, and we recently had a company-wide staff meeting, so I wanted to remind everyone that these are the four bullets in the 2008 strategic plan. So when I came on board, essentially, one and a the first bullet and half of the second bullet was being worked on diligently, okay? So when I come in, <coughs> we, I assess that, and we started working on the second half of bullet two and bullets three and four. So this is what we've been focusing on. This is why we move ahead, even though the organizational reliability study is working in parallel. Provide customers with a product mix that optimizes electric costs and maximizes value through energy efficiency and load management. Procure a long-term, diverse, and environmentally responsive power supply portfolio including consideration of ownership of generation. Assure long-term reliability of the RMLD distribution system and enhance customer service to residential and commercial customers to the highest level. So now we take this and we're going to talk a little bit about how have we been doing that for the last year and a half. So if we go to the next slide, you remember when we sent out the annual reports, we started going paperless. So everything was done digital format. And our mottos, not to be confused with our mission statement, was be efficient, get greener, and go paperless. So what have we been doing and how do they fit into those categories? And if you look under each one of them, I can't really read them from here, but up in efficiency, I'll give you a few examples. The residential hot water program, the time of use rate, uh, energy star rebate program, uh, hard to read, reliability efficiency, career development programs and training, um, the operating standards, the safety committee, construction standards, organization reliability studies that we call for, distribution and substation maintenance programs, the SharePoint communication system, creating the new tech services group and the new apprentice line worker group, uh, and the working groups. So those all fit into the category is let's get efficient. Let's get greener, preserve the environment through non-polluting and energy saving measures. What have we done there? The LED streetlight program, increasing renewable power supply portfolios, solar partnerships, uh, peak demand reduction program that Tom will talk about, transformer load management and substation maintenance program. Go paperless. Let's move towards wireless data for improved communications internally with our customers and within the electric system. The enhanced fiber network um, for the SCADA system, the distribution system, uh, the, the, the new 500 Club AMI system that Hamid will talk about in a few minutes, uh, the responsive communication plan, the SharePoint, uh, paperless billing, uh, online payments, and your iPads in front of you so that we're not putting together these big, huge books every, every month. So this is how those mottos tied in. Next. Okay. 
Here's a list of more as we're meeting the goals and the objectives. Um, I'll just let you read them. We're, what I'm going to do is pick a couple of them in which Tom and Hamid are going to go over in particular. You want to go to the next slide? And there is a couple more. And, I, and you know, this go into a six-year capital and expense budgets. Um, unbundling the bills and the rates, you're all familiar with a lot of the things that we have accomplished. And I just want you to see how those fit into the existing strategic plan. Okay. So next we're going to talk about the technology roadmap and how we're going to make the system smarter so that it communicates with the transmission systems that we connect with and smarter so that we can, if, we're, if we get into a situation where we have an outage, we want to get the power back as soon as possible so we're selling kilowatts again. We want to get right back uh, the power to everyone. Um, this is the 20-year <coughs> plan. We're going to create a smarter system technology roadmap. We're going to develop and implement the GIS plan. We're going to install AMI and a mesh network. Um, Hamid's going to talk about that a little bit more. Everyone familiar here that we have a fixed network AMR system, not an AMI system. So we, we held off on the 500 Club larger customers and we're going to an AMI system. We're going to integrate it on top of the fixed network and then put AMIs here and there where we need that two-way communication. But I'll let Hamid go into that a little bit more. Evaluate and implementation of distribu distribution generation. Develop cybersecurity system for RMLD's technology, which is a requirement, and maintaining reliability. So these are some of the topics that I'm going to let uh, my uh, staff go over in some great detail. Is there any questions so far? Okay, great. Next slide. <coughs> I'm turning it over to Bill Selden to dis start talking about competitive electricity. The, the uh, data, is that data acquisition, is that what the DA stands for in the MI? I'll be brief because uh, Colleen touched on most of this already with the first two bullets. Um, but just to get a little specific on some of the efficiency um, programs that we're working on, for the residential customers, we uh, currently offer uh, renewable energy rebates and appliance rebates. Um, uh, we're becoming a lot more actively involved with uh, solar projects with uh, uh, with our residential customers. We have roughly 30 so far installed on the, on the service territory. On the commercial side, we have the uh, Commercial Energy Initiative, which the efficiency engineers, Tom and Tirza, <coughs> are working diligently on with a lot of our commercial customers, as well as a, a, a lot of lighting rebates. Um, uh, and I'd be, we'd, uh, anybody in our department would be happy to talk in greater detail on any of those types of programs that are currently going on. Let me just hit the, uh, Tom's going to hit on um, distributive de generation a little bit as well as Hamid is. Um, we, we offer a <coughs> myriad of rate options to residential and commercial customers to, uh, to cover efficiency. The controlled hot water heater project, which is in transition right now, we're trying to get all of all of our um, hot water heaters up under one uh, uniform type of technology. We have a time of use rate not only for residential customers but also for the uh, industrial and commercial customers, uh, and uh, we offer interruptible rates. Uh, on for demand response, again, Tom's going to really touch a lot on uh, what he's doing with the peak demand reduction program on the next few slides. Um, again, um, probably the, the, the other thing to highlight is the economic development that we would like to push more of. Um, uh, instead of having a lot of people talk about revenue erosion because of efficiency that's going on, uh, we're trying to meet the challenge by offering um, technology that will help sell kilowatt hours like the uh, electric charging stations, which TIRS has been working on. Uh, which, uh, we applied for a grant, we, we got a grant, and, 
uh, installed some um, units already at some commercial and industrial customer bases, and we're hoping to grow, grow that as well as uh, some more uh, work with uh, sequentric systems, which are wireless and we're, else we're using right now for the hot water heater program, but we can uh, hopefully expand that into other avenues. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom. Be okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you. Hello. Um, as you know, uh, utility studies have consistently uh, ranked RMLD rates as some of the lowest in the state, and our challenge as managers of the organization is to continue that tradition. One of the ways we do that is by working with our largest customers to mitigate the uh, effects of uh, cost pressures that uh, affect all of us. Since 2008, we've had uh, several commercial energy efficiency programs uh, which incentivize upgrading equipment to today's uh, higher efficiency standards. And last year, we added a new program aimed at reducing the peak demand of our largest commercial and munis municipal customers. And that's what I'd like to really focus on tonight, just to give you an overview of how that program works. <coughs> so if you go ahead to the next slide, please. <coughs> for some time, we've been seeing uh, increasing fees for capacity and transmission charges. And almost all of the utility market forecasts indicate that those will continue to rise in the near future. And you can see from this chart that as a percentage of our overall wholesale cost, those two items are becoming a much bigger piece of the pie. So that's really the goal of the peak demand reduction program is to help mitigate those increases. It hasn't <coughs> hit us full force yet, but we know it's coming. So. Uh, we're putting the things in place to help us and our customers deal with that. Tom, just a question. I know you're in the middle of this, but we have a new commissioner, and maybe people in the public don't know what a capacity charge or a transmission charge is. So we do, and you do. But if anybody's watching, uh, maybe just explain what those two things are. Sure, sure. Um, our wholesale uh, co um, power costs are broken down into several buckets, if you will. Um, with the deregulation of the industry uh, several years ago, the industry was divided up into certain segments. There was the power plants that most people think of, you know, Seabrook or the coal generating plant. That's <coughs> the easiest to identify. So it's sort of three phases, the power plants, the transmission lines that take the power from the power plants to get them to the major distribution points. And then the last leg is the distribution side and uh, RMLD is in the distribution segment. So we all, all up the power that we sell to our customers, we have to buy from the power plants and the transmission owners that get, get the power to us. So the uh, so-called capacity costs are tied to the uh, building of the power plants themselves. So tho those are long-term, very l highly capital-intensive investments. So it really has to be thought out ahead of time, and you're, you're sort of accruing money for to pay for those uh, well in advance. And the same thing goes on the transmission side. That's to cover the cost of the copper, the infrastructure, to get the high voltage, the power from the power plants to the distribution centers. So those two items are really tied to the infrastructure of the plants and the, uh, the wires, the, uh, the, uh, the feeding mechanisms that gets the power to us. Just a quick, may I, may I ask a quick question? Sure. The capacity is a function of our peak day on a given month or, or over the year, right? Correct. So that the very highest day of usage is that green piece, green Yes. chunk there. So if it's really just a single day of the whole year 
It's actually it's a single hour. A single hour of the whole year is what results in that giant green thing. That's, that's the way that the industry is structured, that the rates people pay for the, to cover those capacities is determined by uh, that one hour of the year when the, the entire system, all of ISO New England, is maxed out because that's what you have to plan for. From a, an engineering and a systems point of view, it's a horrible way to run a piece of equipment is size it for the worst case and then most of the year it's running at 40% or 30% of capacity. But the way uh, electricity works, you have to be able to supply the demand at that worst case condition. And is that capacity cost our capacity in RMLD, or is that our portion well, of every, the? Well, everybody who uh, takes load has to pay a portion of that. So that's why um, you could think of it that ISO New England, at that peak hour, takes a snapshot of how much power all of the different users are using. And then that piece of the pie, that determines your piece of the pie for the next uh, capacity year. So I just thought we'd do that for, for Dave and anybody else who might yeah. be watching. That's wha why he's doing this, because if we can knock that one hour every month, and, and certainly the one in July that's the worst of the year, mm -hmm. there's a huge payoff, a huge six-figure payoff. Because then we have a smaller piece of the pie of, of this overall cost. Exactly. To charge us. Right. 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 Because we're, uh, we're not a profit-making entity, but all of the costs that we incur, we have to pass along to all of our, our customers. So what we're doing is uh, looking to mitigate that, uh, at least for those two items, for those capacity charges. Um, and yeah, I'd be glad, you know, uh, at another time to answer more detailed questions yeah. with you or ha set up a special section later to go through that in, in more detail because it's... Just wanted to hammer home why what sure. you're doing is so important, which it is, yeah. Sure, absolutely. Um, <coughs> okay, so... Um, so th those two items are becoming a larger and larger piece of the pie. So uh, what we've done is set up a new program, what we call our peak demand reduction program, to really address that. So um, uh, RMLD's uh, PDR program offers our commercial and municipal customers an opportunity to reduce uh, uh, their cost by adjusting their demand during a relatively few number of hours during the year. And the customer can do that one of two ways. They can uh, uh, shed load by turning off equipment or adjusting set points, or they can run uh, on-site generators. In either case, the amount of power they're drawing from our system is reduced. And that's really the goal of the overall system, is when ISO New England's taking that picture, we want our load to be as low as possible. Once they finish taking the picture, we can go back up and it's, <laughs> it's all right. <coughs> so that, again, that's really the goal, to reduce our power during that. I mean, the summer one is the easiest one to identify because it's that, you know, really hot day in July or August when everyone's got their air conditioners cranked up. But on the transmission side, the, the transmission peaks are determined the same way, that max period, but that one is each month. So every month of the calendar year, there's a transmission peak, and our transmission charges, our fees are done the same way. So those peaks are a little more difficult to forecast because they're, you know, not that obvious. Um, so those are the two, way the two ways the customer can uh, reduce the amount they take, uh, shed load or run local generators. Um, by, um, and participation in the program is 100% voluntary. So if the customer decides to opt out of the program entirely or just for certain events, there's no penalty associated with it. So it's really in, in the customer's favor. And the, um, the economic benefit that the customer can uh, accrue is identified in the, if you go to the next, uh, next slide. Uh, this uh, table shows, uh <coughs> one more. So the table summarizes the, uh, the economic bottom line benefit to the customer. For every megawatt of load that they shed uh, equates to a total savings of $60,000 for that customer over the, the, uh, the calendar year of the program. So it's a significant savings for them. 
So it's, it's and, and to achieve that, it's really only a few hours a month that they have to participate. So the key is to working with the customers to educate them on the value of this and enable them to put the uh, equipment and or processes in place to allow them to do this. Some of it's uh, communication gear, getting them the information on what their loads are or tying into automated systems that adjust their air conditioners during those hours. Um, and that's really what, what we've been doing over the past six months to a year is the educational side. Uh, introducing the program, we were running workshops here. We had one a few weeks ago where we had customers come in and spent a, a couple hours training them. We we're doing a lot of on-site visits, energy audits to work with them to figure out depending on the type of company it is, they would have different uh, loads which is important to them. Whether you're, if you're an office building, it's more on the uh, HVAC air conditioner side. If it's a factory, maybe there's certain equipment that they could look at, <coughs> et cetera. So that's, that's where we're at now, is really educating the customers and <coughs> enabling them to participate in the program. Because the more they benefit, the more we benefit. Has the response been good uh, in that? Uh, yeah, the response has been good. We have uh, on the order of 10 to 12 uh, of our larger, and right now this is only a pilot <coughs> project for our largest customers, the so-called 500 Club. Right. Um, so we're focused on them right now, but our goal for long term is to expand this to all customers as well as there's um, projects on the residential side that could uh, contribute to this as well. Primarily things like the hot water heater program that could be tied into a uh, demand reduction approach. But this is, you know, what are uh, sort of the low-hanging fruit that we've been going after. They have the really big chunks of power, that, you know, a megawatt or two at a time. So, uh, yeah, the response has been good. We have 10 or 12 signed up officially and another 10 to 20 that we're in the process of uh, connecting. Um, so that, that's the, uh, the potential payoff. It's up to $60,000 apiece. Um, and the next slide, if you want to go ahead. So this is uh, something that uh, we would use to uh, evaluate specific customers. Again, depending on the category, if it's an office building or a retail or a factory. Go ahead, Phil. Um, this you can't see. Uh, very well, but uh, a, another big piece of the uh, implementation side is setting up a web portal to all of the customers in the program so they can have a live picture of what their load is. So at a given hour or during the day, they can see what their load profile is. And it, it also has automated tools that calculate what the effect uh, was of any load shedding action that they take. So after we call an event the next day, they can say, oh, I ended up saving 200 kilowatts, and that translates into X number of savings. Uh, and then I think the next couple of slides are, you know, similar um, uh, shot screenshots of the, the web-enabled uh, web tools that we provide at no cost to the customer for uh, signing up. Tom? Tom? So yeah, what's <coughs> the significance of the 500? Is that, is that, what does that designate? I think it, I, that's a good question. I think at one time it was 500 <coughs> kilowatt hours or? We did a study several years ago where um, we tried to define what our largest customers were and we looked at cutoff points of 500 kilowatts. So the 500 plug is anybody that's 500 kilowatt or greater. 500 kilowatt peak or 500,000 kilowatt hours? <laughs> yeah, essentially it's our top 50 customers right now is, is the 500 club. So it's a little, so that's a lot of my focus on the uh, support side is working with those larger commercial customers to do this as well as the ongoing day-to-day -day, uh, projects or issues that they have. And are they distributed pretty evenly across the service towns or are they more? It's more primarily more? Wilmington and North Reading is the, uh, bulk of the larger um, users <coughs> for certain areas. Analog is by far our biggest customer in that industrial park over there. And then there's a, uh, the River Park 
area in North Reading and uh, Ballard Vale in Wilmington. Those are the three main centers of where these uh, places are. Any other questions? What about m municipalities and their buildings? Do they get a chance to have this? Yeah, good, uh, good point. Um, uh, th they are included in this, and I've talked with uh, representatives from all the towns. In fact, George and uh, Dennis from Wilmington have looked at that. They've been preoccupied with building a school, some little project <laughs> they have going. Um, but, but all of the municipal um, uh, facilities people I've talked to and uh, at least made them aware of the program and we're still rolling at that out <coughs> because they are, you know, they have some uh, pretty high peaks at some of the school buildings that, that could benefit from it. So uh, there's interest um, and they're certainly eligible to participate. Has the town of Reading or its schools responded to say that they would like to get these savings? I'm just curious. Yes, I'm working with uh, Kelly at um, at the the Reading High School, and um, there, she's relatively new in that job, so it, it's it, she's still evaluating existing programs, and but this will definitely be a piece of you know what she rolls out going forward. They had signed up for some. Uh, um, energy efficiency programs, pay for performance type contracts that are in process. So how this fits into that is, is one of the issues they're struggling with. I, is the town of Reading one of the 50? One of the 500 club? Well, 500, at least the definition I've been using is the commercial side. Mm -hmm. And then the municipals are another piece of that, but they're both eligible for this program. How much could, uh, just to persist, how much could the town of Reading say save if they did this and figured it out? Reading, uh, some of their buildings were peaking, I think, two or four hundred. Uh, so uh, it could be twenty-five, fifty thousand dollars if they, you know, hit all of those. At schools or t or town or that's, both? That's total for the for the whole. Okay, town. so the town of Reading it, has it, an opportunity it, it, to save fifty grand. That's an interesting be, it, data point. It, it could so easily be yeah. tens of thousands of dollars. Okay. Um, so, uh, the uh, a major uh, push for us now is just educating them and enabling them, showing them what they would have to do. Because mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's it's a relatively small amount of effort, but it's still effort. It's something something has to do and. Facilities guys have had <coughs> other white stuff related issues over the last month or so. For so. sure. Well, okay. that's good to know. All right. Yeah, and, and for, for uh, follow up, I'd be glad to answer any more detailed questions later. The 500 club that you're focusing on now, the end of the pilot, where we would become a little bit more aggressive with the next level is when? Well, it is tied into the, uh, the metering program, so it's going to be dovetailed with that because it, in order for us to uh, implement this program, we need to monitor what their usage is. So they have to have the meters capable of uh, recording and, and uh, you know, being the feedback loop for that and uh, how you do it. And then there's other issues like integrating the results into the billing system and crediting them that. So, so those are the the logistics that we have to uh, sort through, but it's, it's all certainly doable and, and, and worth doing because it's a good chunk of money. Maybe this is something that, if I may suggest, that the cab could go back to your, if they don't, if they're not already doing it, you, you know, you could be a liaison back to your town to explain them that they have this savings opportunity and same you could, at your next cab meeting, let the other ones know that they too could ring the doorbell at town hall. Yeah, absolutely. All right, thank you. Uh, one, one last, if I may, sure. one last question. Um, how many of the, of the companies you're working with have these uh, distributed gen generation capabilities, turning on basically um, look like diesel generators that they can turn there's on? There's probably 20 or 30 that have <coughs> a generator quote, but a lot of them are fairly small and don't really uh, – do anything more than some emergency lights ah, and stuff. Okay. The, the ones that have substantial generators is just uh, three or four. Mm -hmm. Charles River Labs has some very large, um, uh, I think they're up to three or four megawatts of uh, generators because of the nature of their business. 
you know, they have to keep their animals alive. Mm -hmm. So um, we're working with them to install some additional emissions equipment to allow those generators to be run in non-emergency, because this is, most of those generators were only permitted to run under emergency conditions, you know, an extreme outage. Interesting. So you can't run them for economic reasons, which is what this would be, unless they're re-permitted. So we're working through those issues with them to get them re-permitted and or adding additional emissions equipment so they can run them without violating any EPA guidelines, et cetera. Yeah, I would think analog would also have uh, very large An Yeah, analog, we've been spending a lot of time with them looking at um, putting in some additional generation. And, and these would all be primarily customer funded. Mm -hmm. you know, so if they uh, invest the money in putting a generator there, that enables them to participate in the program. And, and most of the large ones have to be turned on at least once a year, right? I mean, just to make sure that they work. Well, yeah. really, they, they should go on uh, once a week or once a month. Is that for, right? Just that for awesome? maintenance testing. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, we have one in the, uh, here on campus that they, every Wednesday morning they run that. Oh. The word Primary. generator? Yep. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Primarily gas, right? Or uh, oil and gas? Oil and primarily, diesel. but there, there's a fair amount of diesel. All of the Charles River guys are diesel oh. generators. But, but even those, th those can be uh, outfitted with enough gear that it, mm -hmm. it meets all the EPA requirements. I, I do, oh, go ahead, Tom, sorry. Yeah, I just had a question for Colleen. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you said there's a 2008 strategic plan. Is, is there a process, or how often, you know, every company does it differently, and, and most of the goals are probably evergreen in terms of how they're laid out, but does that get redone every five or ten or seven years, or what's kind of the process? And then how often does it get revisited for some things won't change over the course of the right. next mayor? Uh, the recommendation is usually between three to five years that you're evaluating your yeah. strategic plan and making sure that it's, it's, it's in yeah. line with the most current technology and the business plan and mm -hmm. whether or not the economics have changed. Um, so, so it's possible that the new studies that are in process that we may revisit or post the studies to? Yeah, we'll, we'll get the um, preliminary from the studies and discuss the recommendations. We'll address revising the strategic plan and then we'll lay out the two long term permanent plans for both the system and the, and the, um, the other two. Okay, good. Thank you. I do have, unless anybody else does, I have another question for Tom. So the numbers look just to a uninformed person high, like somebody could get sixty thousand dollars back from RMLD just for turning off things. Where do those numbers come from? Like three dollars and fifty cents for a kilowatt hour when normally they're paying a it's dime. Or it's ra it's it's based on the syst the uh, savings that we achieve uh, on our capacity charges. So we're essentially sharing the total savings that the system gets with the customer. So if, if a customer like the example saves 60,000, our overall system is saving that as well. So our capacity they're charges half? are that. They're getting so half? Every, is that e it? every month, uh, we get, we, 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 Jane gets a bill from the ISO on these are your transmission fees and these are your capacity fees. So it, um, it's all based on those um, so numbers. I get it. So so we're giving them half back that we are. It's not that logic. They're not issuing a check. It's not like you're going to get a commission. Right. It's so. All the capacity and transmission charges are going to be reduced in the total amount that you're going to have to pay. Either. Right. I understand. So, so that way we save and then the customer. I understand. I understand that we're not writing them checks. I understand that their bills are going down right. and that uh, we're saving more than we're giving. We're reducing their. I understand. So but it's about half. Is that it? So Hopefully half, yeah. Who I mean these are these are rates. So but who set those rates? Isn't that what our job, no, the board? This is our well, no, this is just the pilot program. Yeah, okay. Right, and those can be adjusted every year like you know any other program. So uh, but but that's where they came from. They were based on the ISO capacity rates. Okay, I'm just I guess Normally the board, I, I just want to know where the rates come from and do we get a chance to 
set rates on what we're so giving it, back to people. Another example is the rebate that we were writing rebate checks to customers for lowering their uh, peak usage, and that's all based on, you know, how much savings the system sees. So, um, okay, you know, it's a, just a, another program that. So I think I think benefits. I know what you're system. asking, uh, but it's not system wide. Uh, these are, as you mentioned, pilot programs, and then if it grows out of a pilot program to be substantial then that would probably trigger a, let's think of rethink the rates and what they ought to be. Right? I mean, if you can reduce the overall peak and whatnot. I mean, everything's going the right way. It's a yeah. positive spiral. No, no, no doubt, yeah. no doubt. I just was curious where the rates come from, that's all, and wh who sets them. There are also competitive companies out there that just because they're a franchise like right. we're not, that can come in and do the same type of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we want them to come to us because with the one and all, no doubt. we're not getting the reduction in the peak. We still have to pay I see. the peak price because that virtual generation that they're creating by turning on their generator um, is, is worth the money. I so understand. No, I, I get that it's worth it. Yeah. It's great stuff. I'm just, I'm only getting down to the level of rate setting on, on when we're giving people back a certain rate, like where that number comes from and when does the board look at that. Okay. We have no, we don't set those rates. Those rates are dictated to us as to what we're going to pay. The dollar fifty and the three fifty. The dollar fifty and the three fifty are set by FERC, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. nothing we have anything. It's, it's actually twice that. Okay. That's just a calculated credit off of the FERC title mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's all more complicated than we thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, it's it's great stuff. Um, is do we have the, the last question I have is. Um, do we have the technical capacity at this time for, if we wanted to expand it to a larger segment of people, that an average homeowner, okay, they're not going to get 60 grand off their bill, but maybe they'll get 60 bucks <laughs> off their annual bill. They get $5 a month or $10 a month for yeah. turning off the AC at 3 o'clock. Well, right now we are working with the 500 Club because that was that line of I know. new meters that we went to right. for the two-way communication. So as those meters are coming in, do we have them all in yet? Well, no, okay. we, we have to pull. <coughs> they're, they're coming in, and as we start to implement them into the 500 Club, or whoever wants to participate in, in that group, and then, you know, we, we have to talk more about how many of these meters we, we, want, we want to buy, because you, you have an investment of the AMR system that you right. don't want to um, eliminate, but that gotcha. two-way communication is where we need to target. So that the next level of people that we address um, will be probably the next level of usage and um, right. and look at the cost to us and then maybe what we give back to the customer if we have to put more capital into it to change the amount of right. meters that are already in existing. Yeah, on, on the residential side, the hot the electric hot water heaters is probably the low hanging fruit right. that we go at. And, and we started a pilot program with those that we have 200 or so in the field now we could expand that and do a, mo uh, you know, a more aggressive peak demand program with that to, you know, each individual house is not a whole lot, but when you add them all together, you know, it gets substantial. Right. And, and the good thing about those is the homeowner is r really not actively involved, so we're, we're controlling uh, their hot, hot water heater so it won't go Understood. on in the afternoon. Right, right. So it's, it's much easier to implement than calling up the facilities manager at analog and say, hey, shut that machine off. It's, right. it's like cold showers. In the it's more, o more automated. <laughs> without, without cold showers. <laughs> We're not affecting comfort or, or performance at all, believe me. Dave, you might be mentioning like uh, a home area network where you're on a time of use rate and you have this box in your house that you're sending me a message that says it's a peak and the resident lowers their peak usage during that hour, then certainly we can come up with a program to incentivize them as well. Right. It's just getting that two-way communication to the home area <coughs> network um, and how many people would be interested in that and how many meters we'd have to right. pay back. Right, understood. Well, top level, it's all great stuff. I, th I mean, it's long overdue that the department is, is doing this stuff. It's obviously a huge payback for the rate payer, you know, at the high, at the high level. It would be. Is this the end of the presentation? Yes. I keep interrupting. I'm oh, sorry. It's the end of Tom's. <laughs>
<laughs> so I guess is is there some you simple <laughs> is there a, is there a bottom line on this that we expect it's going to cost X in terms of the givebacks, but we're going to get Y back? You know, what are those two numbers that we good to see that at some point, just so that we know you know we're giving these amounts back, but we're seeing this larger savings um, as you progress to just get that summary. Yeah, we can put together charts yeah. Of, yeah. of what the future. But it, but, it, but in as, as Tom said. Capacity transmission is going to be going up understood significantly. So, um, but just some projections, and just so we know how we can get a sense, and so can the public about how much the department is saving ratepayers and saving, you know, and, and improving our business through these efforts would be great to see. Just some summaries and sure. projections down the road. All right. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. You're welcome. Excellent yeah. stuff. Excellent. Yep. yep. All right, uh, proposed distributed generation installation. We proposing approximately 20 megawatts over the next 10, 20 years uh, for as distributed generation project. Uh, these are the type, these are the mini generators that uh, doesn't require that heavy permitting like the emergency or backup generators. And we can run them for number of hours like 600 to 1000 hours during the peak which is going to actually the peak shaving unit uh, that as you saw in the previous slide, uh, the, the, those two uh, uh, sections for the, the transmission and capacity. So these units are being used basically as peak shaving during the peak so you could get credits for capacity and transmission and those are great. This is where the industry trend is moving toward. Uh, basically the benefits are uh, the demand response peak shaving, no loss of kilowatt hour sales, and the New England uh, ISO is issuing credits uh, for both capacity and transmission, which everybody all over, the, all the rate payers, they're gonna benefit from that, as it was discussed. And uh, uh, the cost, how much will it cost? It's gonna cost approximately $1 million installed per megawatt. And uh, these, we got two models. We're working on actually two models for RMLD. One is customer owned, which means the customer, they're gonna be paying for the installation. And uh, the benefit for us would be that we get 50% of the credit and customer gets another 50% credit from the capacity and transmission. We did analysis for one of these units for approximately for four megawatts over the period 10 years. We can save approximately $5 million, five million dollars, 5.7 million dollars or 570 thousand dollars a year savings for us if we move toward this program. So I see the, excuse me if I may ask a question, sure. uh, the ROI is about five years or so yeah. on it. What's the equipment life? The equipment life is generally for the hours that they're being run, it's about 10 years, oh, 10 so to 15 okay. years. So for the first five years you, you'd be paying the credit that you get, basically it's paying off for right. the unit. And then anything after that, it's a free, free uh, credit right. that is coming to us. So if you recall, this is the new technology trend. If you recall right back 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you had these big uh, uh, mainframe computers that now they're replaced by iPads. And you know, the same kind of concept, these big hefty power plants, which is gonna cost billions of dollars. Now they've been broken down into mini generators on s s site for increasing the reliability and economic cost benefits that they do have and they bring now. Now the capacity and transmission credit is gonna triple in 2017. So if, they, if that happens, which the New England ISO has promised or they predicting it's gonna happen, these units could be paid back even less than five years, probably at faster rate, probably three and a half to four years. So this is where the technology trend is. Like what I said, we've got two templates, one for the customer pay, and the other one is for RMLD. Or RMLD, we're trying to do that to install those units at the substations, which you see at the right over here. These are the generators that they go on the feeders. The limit is two and a half megawatt per feeder without getting into heavy permitting. And we can use those during the peak and bring the cost savings to, to our rate payers, which is really great and it makes economic sense. Any questions? Um, could you mention some of the 
other towns that are... Mm. Yeah, the other towns that they're looking into, municipals, are Middleborough. We just visited. They, they, they're installing some of these units. Uh, the, the I believe uh, Taunton. Yes, Taunton they're going. Definitely Taunton. Braintree is looking into that. And uh, West, Boylestone. West Boylestone. Shoesbury, yeah, Shoesbury had them for a while, right? They've had them for a while. But the Shoesbury units are not, this, uh, these are not the new efficient generators. These are the old technology that Tom and I, we visited, we, and uh, we looked at them. So it is, the, these are the micro, like micro turbines. They're, they got silencer that, you know, they're running very efficiently and low noise, like at 50 to 50 decibels, which is a little bit audible, yeah, if you stay like about 10, 15 feet away from the generator. But as you move away 10 or 15 feet, you barely can hear these units. So with the new technology. And the good thing about <coughs> that is that, you know, we can uh, operate that from the SCADA, which is going to be part of this slide that I'm uh, uh, going to be explaining. Yes, sir. So uh, what's your vision on this? So it sounds like it's an easy, quick win for IMLD. But can you envision <coughs> several of these over the next? We I envision like about 10 of these units, 10 to megawatts. But because of the future, don't know, we don't know how these, whether these credits are sustained or not. We're going to move toward this technology, you know, cautiously. Like if we, if we could put two megawatts per year or, you know, and within the next 10 years to ramp up to 20 megawatts. Uh, so by then we know how the market plays and whether it makes sense to continue or, you know, and then we, these units are paid at a faster rate, like what I said in 2017. So we want to use th this opportunity to put these units, uh, not to go crazy with them, but at least to start putting these units to see the economic benefits and make sure these are paid at a, at a faster rate. And then later on, if the credit is continued, uh, so it's benefit for everybody. If not, at least we have them, which is going to still be going to benefit from by cutting down the cost of the capacity in the area. So which if I may, it, it so sounds like very logical and is it the, uh, it sounds like the logical place is the substation where you're going to be putting them in. Yes. Is there any, I mean, just, I'm not trying to be facetious, sure. but it, can you put them in the building next door? <laughs> I mean, is there well, if you choose to, yes, you can put them at the government buildings. That's one of the sites. Mm -hmm. One of the sites that we're proposing and we are, uh, we've been studying is that old substation that was retired uh, in Linfield. Oh. We got right across from Town Hall, there is a alley, there is the mini, mini plaza, and on the right, we got a, a retired substation. We already cut pipes mm -hmm. that they go out on Main Street. And you know, if we put one unit right there, it's out of sight, out of mind. It's, uh, there is only one property, which is uh, approximately about uh, 100 feet away from so there are sites available. That yeah, you can mm -hmm. place them there are places. sites available there. The new substation that we're building in Be uh, Wilmington, mm -hmm. that's a proposal. That's another one that we could put even fewer of these units at the new substations. You know, three, four, five. But like what I said, we are still studying, doing the numbers, and we want to make sure that, you know, we move toward this technology uh, in a calculated way. So we don't want to invest all of a sudden, you know, billions, uh, millions of dollars over here, and then all of a sudden we see that, you know, well, all the capacity and transmission credits are being cut away, and now the payback for these units are going to be like s a seven to ten years. So that we don't want that to happen. So we are moving, li like what I said, very cautiously. But right now it makes economic sense, and uh, that's where the technology is going. Uh, and even if we pay them off within five to six to seven years, it's still it worth having these units because uh, during the peak time you fire them up from the SCADA, pushing one button, and that one that means the cost saving in the capacity and transmission both for everybody, all the rate payers across the board. I mean, um, yes. <coughs> have you had initial discussions at all with any of the towns of where these are going to be sited? We haven't, we are looking, <coughs> what, at the substations, yes, we know pretty much, pretty much we are going to have, basically it's at our liberty. And we're getting the permit for that, obviously. At the other sites, we haven't approved, because this is still in the design stage and idea. 
Uh, I'm proposing one unit, one two megawatt unit for FY 2016 and putting in the budget. Mm -hmm. And you now we can get municipal bonds for that. That's going to increase the plant value. Mm -hmm. And it's going to have some of the cost savings on the rates to keep the rates, you know, at least for everybody. The, uh, before I want to I get that before FY 2017, which as soon as we reach then, then uh, I'm sure the price of these units are going to go up too because all the manufacturers, they want a portion of the pie as well. Sure. So this is the time to get in, and that's what we're proposing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, along those lines, if I may uh, continue, what it is that you know we are looking, uh, this slide is showing the, the grid uh, modernization in one snapshot. Hamid, to see before yes, you sorry. jump into this, I did have a question about those. Sure. These are gas generators? These are gas driven, there are two types the gas and also diesel. Okay. Dual fuel ones, they're more expensive than, you know, it's gonna cost you approximately, if you wanna go dual fuel, the cost is gonna go up. It's not efficient, and now you're gonna get more into environmental yeah. limitations and permitting, which we're trying to avoid. Okay, couple questions. Sure. Are those assumptions based on today's fossil prices, or are they based on what they were two years ago, i.e. double what they are now, and what they will be in the future? They are based on the old uh, prices. The last price that we got was about, about six months ago, you know, and it was based on whatever the price was six months ago. And, uh, of the unit? Of the units, right. I'm talking about the price of the fuel. The price of the fuel, no, uh, they, they're not based on that. I don't think it is the, the saving, prices I mean that you know. Uh, the operation. Right. right. So I understand. Yeah. Right. I got you. It doesn't really matter that much. Okay. So another technology that's right. getting better are batteries. Lithium ion batteries are getting, they've been dubious for grid storage and discharge, but they're getting way better really quickly. And the DOE has huge programs, and there's all kinds of products coming out in grid batteries, mm -hmm. which would do exactly the same thing where you would, as you know, Right. You would trickle charge them overnight when power is dirt cheap, mm -hmm. and bang, turn it on at 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., discharge them, do the same thing at night. So I would like to see yeah. a, to a, a full analysis that's why this would be better than a lithium-ion battery, given that we'd be talking a couple, three years from now before we'd right. be putting one in. Right now, to the base of, the, as I've done the research, it's not really, it's not cost uh, uh, economical, you know, there's not, the economic benefits for the batteries are not there yet because they're not efficient and these are not, you need huge field with huge amount of these battery cells in order to store the energy, the maintenance cost and all said and done, it's like solar technology, which the efficiency, uh, everybody gets excited about it, yeah, let's put the solar panels up and here they, yeah, if they cost right now, it, per kilowatt uh, hour that you know they can deliver, the cost is astronomical. It's okay. not the right. They pay the return of investment on the solar energy is approximately 15 You're to 20 years. talking about batteries, though. For batteries, it's going to be more than 10 years. There absolutely no way that, you know, you can find a system that I can guarantee you that the, the payback, the return of investment is going to be around five years for any type of installation. Well, I think the other thing we, we need to consider, because, I mean, I'm always intrigued by the batteries as well. Right. Um, it'd be great if we could do a, some, a test in parallel right. with them if it didn't cost too much. Uh, but this is a proven technology yes. that you're talking about. It's been in the field. It's well tested, very reliable. The battery, and, and you're right, the batteries are coming out, and I've gone through some of the presentations. Right. Those batteries, they are huge, and yeah. then you have to convert it into AC. You need right. all these inverters. You need all kinds, right. kinds of issues. Right. Okay, so with it. point taken. So the other one is... Expansion of the sort of programs That's Tom right. is talking That's about. Right. So you want to knock your two megawatts off right. Right. with this new fossil fuel generator that you've put somewhere. That's right. The same two megawatts would become from an even further expansion of the sort of thing Tom and right. Pauline and you all right. are working on. Every so bit helps. Right. So what I'm saying is why would we not simply further expand the peak shaving op options to a deeper level to the you know, 500 club and the 400 club and the whatever it is, go to the next level down and do the same thing. Why would we want to add this rather than just do the do it intelligently and knock the demand down? 
but incrementally we are moving toward this. Remember, these are all new technologies, right. and we want to make sure we can take the minimum risk, but like what uh, uh, Mr. Stempek said, we want to make sure we approach the proven technologies first, and then slowly migrate toward the developing technology. I get the high concept. What I'm saying is I would like, to, as with batteries, which maybe you're right that the, mm -hmm. they're non-starters, the analysis of why oh, sure. we can before we get a budget right. that says right. we're going to spend mm -hmm. a seven-figure sum and go through permitting and a local siting mm -hmm. of a mm -hmm. fossil fuel generator in our district, that we've, we've explained how the same thing could be done right. with expansion of what Tom's talking about. Right and what the relative cost benefits and complexity is of doing either one. Oh. Um, because uh, you're about to talk about your, s your smart grid, which is amazing, okay. which is exactly what could do, you know, and that's the future right there. Right. Well, I, you know, uh, history repeats itself. Right. And, and I remember when I first came to Reading, well, we were paying off a bond issue on an, an incinerator, which was the hot new environmental mm -hmm. technology. Mm -hmm which we never used. The town never used it, from my understanding. Mm -hmm. But yet we had this huge bond issue that we were trying to pay off through our taxes mm -hmm. because we didn't either have the right environmental permit, but it was hot technology at the time. Right. So I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little, I love new technology, but I'm a little leery of it. And I agree, we need to go through the analysis. Uh, and I think it would be wonderful if we could do a trial test. Well, I thought you were gonna about to make the opposite point, that we're, we're about to issue a bond for $2 million to put up a generator that becomes a, a, a stranded white elephant <laughs> because we turned out not to need it thanks to efficiencies and thanks to smart grid. <laughs> but it turns out you, I thought you were helping this same point I was trying to make, but I'm afraid I think that it, 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 could, it could cut both ways though, that argument that, it could. Yeah, so right. anyway, sure. there'll be a discussion at the board level Definitely. about this going forward. By all means. We and maybe in the communities when we start saying we're going to put diesel generators, right. you know. So. Gas driven. These are the ones we are proposing yeah, the gas, gas driven. Okay. So it's got to be with the natural gases, with the low yeah. pressure. As you guys know in North Reading, the, you know, this pipeline issue has got everyone going cuckoo. Mm -hmm. yep. All the backyard yes. thing. Yeah. yeah. So again, caution being is right. if you're going to, we're going to do this, you get out early in front of the town right. and the people because they, I mean, it's a very tough issue now in North Reading, and um, what's the issue? Sorry, the, the proposed pipeline, okay. mm -hmm. Linda Morgan pipeline, mm -hmm. coming right through the town. Yep. Right. These are not. It may I ask? May we add just one point? These are these are not any different than when you buy generator for your house as a backup. These are the same units. Well, they're same a bit bigger, but and a little bit, it, it would be a little bit big, yeah. But the same concept, same units that you know, it's not going to it's not going to consume much gas. Right. You know, run. it's the low pressure and very efficient, limited hours. You're ta talking about only if 600 hours a year, mm -hmm. if it happens, mm -hmm. you know, maybe less. Mm -hmm. But for that 600 hours, the benefit that you get, the economic benefit, it just justifies you. We, we could do the numbers and show you that exactly how, mm -hmm. they, they were actually I do have, we've been interviewing few vendors that they do this uh, technology and they sell it. And then you could see. The organizational study and reliability study consultants are also looking at that right. this in parallel. Right. So yeah. they'll be making recommendations that are separate from, you know, we're trying to keep what we're proposing and laying out separate mm -hmm. from what they're going right. to. But we are sending them this so that they can evaluate mm -hmm. it and give us their opinion. Good. Great. Okay. Good, good discussion. Yeah. Great. The grid modernization, this is like a 30,000 feet uh, basically plan that shows within the next 10 to 15 or 20 years, this is the direction, <coughs> these are all the, all the pieces they come together. We got three areas or three technologies. This is the AMI, this is the home area network, and this is the distribution automation or distributed devices. What happens over here, as uh, Colin explained, we have a not completely fully uh, full AMI technology, it's a v, uh, RMLD invested close to two and a half million dollars a few years ago into AMR technology, which is not full two-way, it doesn't have the full two-way communication capability. And as a result, we're not gonna be able to implement some of the uh, technology-driven uh, uh, devices and they, they we're not gonna be able to have two full-way communication from the office <coughs> to the meter and meter back to the office. So in order to do that now, and plus we got 65 meters, these are all club 500, the, 
the usage is 500 kilowatt hours, uh, kilo, kilo kW or more, that these units, uh, ITRON doesn't have any, uh, any uh, technology available for them or any solution for <coughs> them. So what we did, we, we, uh, we just recently had a bid uh, to employ a technology and we were looking into technology that could actually, we could kill two birds with one stone. We just didn't want it that to invest on AMI that could, you, you could utilize our existing AMI iTron system without, you know, without uh, spending more money and uh, actually uh, changing out all the meters. We wanted that to be able to be integrated into the new technology as well as be able to do all the demand response and distribute the generation and, uh, and uh, the dis distribution automation over here, uh, which is future trend and future technology, because the reason for the distribution automation is the faster we restore the outages, the faster the meters, they're gonna be restored and the m money making for RMLD. So these three areas we looked into and we purchased uh, basically the Eaton technology, which is latest and newest, which is the si this system, this network, it's a mesh network. It's gonna be able to handle the, uh, the metering system needs as well as the demand response and home area network devices, which the next generation of uh, the home appliances, they're gonna be IP based. So you can run them right from your iPad or from, so the Zigbee technology that they used to now, it's obsolete almost. Uh, so the new generation of appliances, they're all IP based. So this system is uh, gonna be able to handle the IP based technology very well. And uh, uh, the bandwidth is large enough that we can bring the distribution uh, uh, devices, the IEDs, intelligent electronic devices out in the field, back to the office over here. So these three systems, they're gonna send the data into the data collector on the poles that we're gonna have. And the data collector, is there is a firewall over here, is gonna pass on to the switch that you're gonna convert the signal into fiber. And the fiber is gonna jump on the RMLD fiber loop, which we have all over in all, all the system, with 17 nodes, fiber nodes. So as soon as the radio signal is reaching one of these nodes, it's gonna jump, this, uh, the, the data is gonna jump on this fiber loop or fiber network, and that's being brought back to the servers in the office and pa walls it passing through another firewall for security. So the data security is there. And then we're gonna bring all, to this, all this subsystem, which is outage management system, SCADA system, AMI server, demand side uh, management, and the Cogsdale. So all of these data, this system is gonna be able to feed all of these servers so every server can get the related data, the data that needs for processing and integrating all the information together. The next slide, please. This slide shows once the information comes to these uh, uh, host servers, then it's gonna be transferred into some type of, they call it service-oriented architecture or enterprise service bus, which is a data superhighway. What it does, every lane is dedicated for a certain data, that it's not gonna slow down the speed of the servers and data processing. So once that data comes in and it's gonna be classified to what goes where, uh, then from there, it's gonna go to the customer information system, billing, integrated work order management system, and for reporting. This is the historic data. The real-time data from the SCADA and outage management system is gonna go into the real-time bus. It's a server, real-time server, that it's gonna come to the SCADA for processing for the fault detection isolation restoration system, which means automatically the fault is going to be uh, isolated within a matter of seconds rather than hours. That means the, matter, the meters, they're gonna be brought back to life faster. Uh, with the OMS system, outage management system, which we're gonna have the map that shows exactly where the pocket the outages are, and the system is smart enough that can detect what could be the possible problem, where the fault is, and once the sensors, they sense the fault, they can send a message to the iPads or to the field devices, field personnel. So the, dis the trucks are gonna be rolled right to where the fault is, and when they get there, the fault is uh, automatically isolated. So they can get to work, make the repairs, and then, you know, uh, fast restoration of the system 
rather than having 2,000 customers out, we're gonna shrink it down to maybe 50 customers to 100 customers. Mm. So faster restoration for those. And then we got the conservation voltage reduction. That's another technique for saving and making sure that you know during the peak time, so we reduce the demand of electronic devices by lowering the voltage. Now the lowering voltage doesn't mean that the electronic devices, they're gonna get damaged. What it means, once you reduce the load, the linear load that the voltage and the current, they chase one another, they're gonna reduce the demand without damaging the appliances. And then, you know, but the nonlinear load is still gonna have, uh, you know, the voltage is gonna keep up with the, with the current. And then we got the simulator. The simulator is for engineers, so they can, in the background, they can simulate the data for switching, which way to do the switching to be more efficient, productive, and uh, less labor intensive, which is gonna bring more savings uh, for, the, for, for us. Another one is the power factor corrections. Now we're gonna have all these capacitors that right now, they're being driven, they're manually operated, which means during the peak time, uh, which we're trying to lower the demand of the system, that's another way to save money and you know, uh, get less capacity transmission uh, charges from the New England ISO. These are the field personnel, they're gonna have to go to out you know, on the streets and then turn the capacitors on manually. We're gonna automate those, and those once they're automated, they can be controlled through the SCADA, and they're gonna be programmed so as the load comes up, these capacitors, they come in at different locations, and they're gonna suppress the rising demand. And that way, you know, you're not gonna be paying through the roof uh, during the um, peak, uh, peak sun. So in a nutshell, this is what it is. The goal is for the next 10 to 20 years, bring the data from the field, more intelligent data for processing more intelligently to become efficient and more productive and bring more cost savings for the rate payer. And this is, in a nutshell, the plan. And these are coming in pieces, and as these pieces they put together, you know, we're gonna give you a report that what piece is done until this whole picture is completed. So, so you have rank ordered which ones are most important? Yes. And which ones you're doing first, second, yes. third, et cetera? Yeah. The, this year what we did, we upgraded the SCADA system, uh, and also we purchased the OMS system that is gonna be integrated with the CIS. The reason we did that, because I wanted to have the system before we, we implement the AMI system mm -hmm. for testing, to make sure all the data from the iTron as well as I AMI, they both could come and be hosted in the server, and the server, the integration goes seamlessly with the OMS system. So that we, we've done, and we purchased the cybersecurity firewalls. So those are all done this year. Uh, and then as we go on for the, in the next years, you know, we have in the budget that we spend money for the field switches, electronic devices, and uh, we got another map which shows the location of the switches, where is the optimal location for the switches. The you know, engineers, they've been working on it, and we have that completed. We pass that information on to Booth and Associate for revisiting, making sure that you know, well, uh, we have adequate uh, switch locations, uh, get another set of eyeballs, you know, put another set of eyeballs on it, making sure we're not going overboard or we're not uh, going under, so, you know. So uh, this is being reviewed by them, and once they review, they give us the recommendations, then that's gonna be the basic the template for us. Yes? I do have questions. Sure. Uh, well, a lot of this is technical, and I didn't understand it, and I think right. probably others didn't as well. I don't know right. if did. Oh, you guys, right. you want, oh, you are. John's gonna get up and explain it now for us. <laughs> <laughs> but I get the high concepts. So yeah. it's, it's, it's outstanding that we're gonna have a smarter grid is the right. bottom line. And I think for the average person who might be watching, um, is the goal uh, that we have faster responses to outages and smarter management of incidents so that there's more reliability or is it mostly so that we can control demand to b these earlier points we were talking about this evening? The three things that I want you to take out of this meeting. Number one, this plan here, at the end of the day, once it's implemented, it's gonna minimize the duration and the frequency of the outages. 
That's right the top goal. That's the top goal. Okay. Right then being out for hours, the people, you're gonna, this, you're gonna be restored unfaulted section. The section is not, it's not damaged. Okay. It's gonna be restored within seconds, okay. right then hours, which right now, that's what the case is. If the section is damaged, we're gonna have to roll the trucks, everything from the station all the way to the last point on, on the c circuit. It's for the safety. It's gonna have to be inspected, switching is gonna have to be done, and then the people, it takes minimum uh, 45 minutes to an hour. What, what will this cost, what you're describing here, to have it be done this way? Well, the overall cost, because we go doing it over 10 to 15 or maybe 20 years, it, it varies depending on number of switches, number of uh, uh, the technologies that you're use, using. Mm, it could cost anywhere between 10 to 20 million but like what I said, as you go uh, and you know the technology evolve, one of the good things about this, that we stretching it over 10 to 20 years, is that you know well we want to make sure that you know we keep up with the technology. Technology that we employing today, this is open architecture, so it's not nobody can call it obsolete five or 10 years from now, because it's adaptable, flexible. You can match it to anything that you know you like. I have a couple. Just a, th sure. these are just kind of quick ones. Sure. So to what extent right now do we have a problem with long duration and frequent and numerous outages? I thought we were pretty good and we don't have a lot of outages. No, we don't, but the system, remember, we got some maintenance issues that hasn't been addressed, like the substations and the switches and you know the out in the field. We got number of maintenance and the transformers. So because it hasn't really reached that point, it doesn't matter that it doesn't it doesn't mean that you know well we're not gonna get there. We want to maintain the reliability. In order to maintain the reliability, you have to keep up the maintenance as well as invest in the infrastructure Got it. in order to make sure it and plus as we go right now, when we have an outage during the storms that we don't have any control over. Obviously, you're going to see the hours of our day. That's why you're going to see in my report in a few minutes that you see the frequency, the outages, they keep going up above national or sometimes, okay. you know, the regional average. And, you know, the goal is to bring those down. And if I can restore the powers to the people within a matter of seconds, I don't want them to be out for an hour. It doesn't matter even if there is one, you know. Every customer matters. I thought you would be happy that we're using the fiber loop. Yes, I, I am. I, that was my next question. Is, uh, are you going to need to expand any of the fundamental infrastructure to, to do this? Well, n uh, right now, we don't have to go overboard, and we don't have to expand it uh, all over, because we got the infrastructure right now can respond to the needs of the system. But as we have these contracts that they come in with the light tower, and you know the building, basically, they building the fiber loops for us, uh, and we choose the routes that they got to go to the areas that, you know, we benefit the most as well as them. So once they build these and they transfer the ownership to us, we're getting the fiber for free. Okay, so we will need to expand out yeah, our fiber we're network. We're going to do over, uh, over years, we're going to expand, yes, but not immediately. Right so now, we have what In, we in need. case there's any mis- my questions are not because I have anything against any of this, it's great. It's all great stuff. It's because I'm very interested in it. Right. And That's I want to see us succeed with it. I realize how important it is. I'm just trying to understand it better. By all means, And if yeah. anybody happens to be watching, that they also, and other board members too. You know, I certainly would like to see the push be more towards the intelligence gives us the, the demand side management right. as a priority. I know it's everything and it's it's the future and it's great. But to the earlier points, you know, that, that, the, that the tech push is mm -hmm. more about demand management. Mm -hmm or at least equally, right. that it's doing all those things. And you know what I'm going to say about the fiber, too, is that we, you know, we, need, to, we need to be looking at uh, other ways to sure. generate revenue for the department right. off, of our, off of our fiber. Well, so. this plan definitely is going to uh, make uh, our integrated resource uh, the department more capable for implementing the demand response right. and all of those uh, energy savings. That because we're going to be able to bring more information from the field and the customers back for processing into office. And we don't have to depend on a third party. Right now, we, we are doing the, our demand response with Tangent. We're not going to need Tangent or Internoc or anybody else. We don't want them. 
in the you know better for a long for us time. To it's to better it for us, right. for exactly. our customers, and for the bottom line of RMLD. We want us to have complete control over our own destiny, where we should invest. Removing middlemen is a good goal. Yeah. Yes. Do you have any comments, Phil? I heard you mentioning. Well, the only thing that I, you mentioned there were three items. I only heard one so far. You said there were two other items that you that you had priorities on. The priority is the, like the uh, cutting down the duration and frequency of the outages, even though the reliability is good, and you know, but we got some maintenance to do. Uh, the other one is the other one is the uh, rate stabilization. This is the idea that it's going to help us to implement more demand response program and more programs of that type in order to uh, keep the rates low and basically uh, stabilize them. Because the market, the way that it's, it's gone, uh, once the in 2017, the capacity transmission is, you know, triple. You know, we're all going to be paying more, whether we want it or not. NSTAR and National Grid has already have already uh, increased their rates by 30, 37 percent. They've uh, already done it. They, yes. uh, they've already done that, and we've all feel the pain. So this is going to have uh, helped the program, so we can initiate and implement more of these programs for keeping the rate low. And plus, the third one, which is the big dr dr drive on that, is efficiency and uh, productivity. It's going to increase the productivity and efficiency of the operation. Anytime the trucks are rolling out, that's meaning you know, you, you're spending money. The rate payers are spending money for truck rolls. And one of the DOE's uh, uh, goals for the smart grid or grid modernization or IntelliGrid is that you know well you have less truck rolls on the streets so you d you spend less money on the operation cutting down the operational expenses and this is another way that it's going to help i hope it is clear do you see that yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's all great yeah. nice presentation Good. we're Thank very you. happy that this is happening in the department great i don't know if they speak yeah. or else but yeah. it's very yeah, great yeah, absolutely yeah. Yeah. thank you so mm -hmm. appreciate it any questions Thank you. Is, this is a roadmap. Yeah. It's a right. vision. It, it has to be laid out yeah. in a schedule. Yep. It has to go through mm -hmm. budget process every right. year. We're right. just trying to, you know, formulate the long-term plans. Mm -hmm. It's long overdue. Because right. we didn't really yeah. have any planning. Nope. No. So what's happening is long overdue, and this board appreciates it, at least to the extent I speak for my colleagues. You speak for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I'll use a term that we're used to use a long time ago. Yeah. You, you have a blinking green light, so you can go forward. <laughs> we, you know, as you said, you look at the risk, you look at the cost-benefit analysis, we're not going to recommend anything without the figures coming forward. Yeah. You know, sometimes I guess that's the downside of, you know, showing a peek right. into the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, You know, because the analysis isn't all done. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. So I'm, I'm jumping the gun on some questions, but maybe – Pointlessly, but and maybe obviously we're going to have more presentations, yeah. and we're going to get your, your approval and blessing to continue move forward for every piece. So, right. mm -hmm. you'll be in the loop. Thank you. Thank you. Who's the next? Uh, th where's the next slide? This is yours, me. Proactive. Oh, proactive maintenance program. This is another thing that you know we started at uh, uh, RMLD, uh, comprehensive substation maintenance program. Uh, we developed a cyclic substation maintenance <coughs> program so we can uh, prolong uh, the life expectancy of our assets. Uh, and we just finished uh, uh, substation testing uh, uh, for all substations, th three or four. Some of those yeah, transformers yeah. or the <laughs> equipment hadn't been tested for years. So we just finished it and we found out a few problems that we're fixing or they've been fixed, the ones that you know, they needed immediately be fixed. Formation of tech services group. This was another great thing that you know happened to uh, RMLD because now we're training our techs so they can perform those services. We just spent approximately one hundred fifty thousand dollars, hired outside consultant to do and comp do the testing at the substations. We and now in the future we're going to be able to test all the equipment with the exception of the one fifteen kV breakers and one fifty kV infrastructures. Everything else we're going to be able to do it in house which is another uh, accomplishment. Uh, distribution system maintenance program. We got seven programs that we ever initiated, and those are, again, in order to keep up with the maintenance. We got transformer replacement programs. We got some transformers that uh, they're aged, really old, like uh, 
40, 45 years. Uh, and the life expectancy of the transplant is based on the IEEE Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers is approximately 20 years. So depending on the loading. So anything over 20 years, you are kind, kind of basically you're on your own. Uh, the fact that some of the transformers that we've had leaking in the past, they were contributing factor to the age. The age was a contributing factor to the failure. So that program, we've identified all the transformers and now we're replacing them you know, in a reasonable manner because you can't replace 1,800 transformers e in a year and immediately. So within the next five to six years, we're going to replace them all. So we add more to the plant value. And one one question, how many are, are that old and that, that we got about 1,800 transformers. We got a total of 3,670 transformers. We got about 1,800 of those that uh, they are over 20 years old. We got about 300 uh, pad mount transformers. These are the ones that you know they got, uh, you know, large uh, oil, uh, and you know these are the ones that you know they usually rust in the bottom and then they start releasing. We, we've been paying close to $250,000, $300,000 for oil cleanup. Mm. Anytime those, they, they, they oil release, the oil release is not uh, cheap. The operation costs you anywhere between twenty dollars to $50,000 depending on the severity of the leak and release. So we're trying to avoid that. That's the avoided cost, and that's why we're going through this program, to make sure we, we become proactive rather than reactive when something happens. We got pole testing. We got approximately 6,400 poles that we own in the RMLD system in all four communities. And based on the uh, USDA uh, mandate, we're supposed to test 10% of our own poles, which means 640 poles. We recently completed 640 poles that they were tested, and the ones that they needed to be uh, addressed immediately, they were taken care of. And we have that process continuing, uh, continued process to replace them all until everything that is on the list is taken care of. We have a manhole inspection program. We got some manholes in downtown areas and uh, other areas in the system in the uh, U, uh, URDs, urban rural development, uh, like uh, you know the, uh, the, 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 the underground infrastructures that we have in the various parts of town. Uh, and these are being inspected to make sure that our assets are, uh, are completely in good shape. And if there are any sign of premature failure or something that happened, we want to get to them before they actually fail. Uh, we have the tree trimming. We revamped our tree trimming program. Now we got a good program in place. We just hired a good, one of the best contractors, Mayor Tree Services, and now, uh, and uh, we, we, we are going, we, we visited with all the towns and we uh, gave them a presentation basically to every, uh, the board members uh, that we'd like to cut back from five feet, we want to increase it to seven feet because then in some areas we've been visiting twice uh, in order to keep up with the maintenance so the, the limbs, they're not approaching the energized wires and causing failures. So we got a good program for that. The porcelain cutout replacement, I'm going to give you a report in a little, uh, little while uh, that you're going to see we got uh, almost 85% of the porcelain cutouts that they shatter anytime there is a fault. They've been replaced. We got approximately 20% more to go, and those are going to be replaced for both safety and also durability of, uh, uh, of the system. Quarterly inspection of the 13.8 kV, 35 kV feeders. This is another thing that we want to get to the areas that, you know, po if there, are, there is anything going on in the system, if there is a broken spreader or something that, you know, we, we could see that vi visually we could see could potentially lead to a failure. We want to get to it before it happens. So all the circuits in the, the, sis in the system, quarterly, we patrol them just making sure that you know, if there is any obvious uh, ar areas that need to be addressed, we address to them, being proactive again. And this is the most important part that you know, it was initiated this year, the infrared scan of the substations and the underground facilities in the parks. And uh, uh, we've captured few problems at the substations that they've been addressed, they've been fixed, and every month our crews, they go to the substations, they do that, and we compare the temperature changes 
And if we see that you know, there is a trend and something needs to be addressed, we address it again before it contributes to the, to the failure. Uh, and then we got the building and ground maintenance plan that you know, for truck maintenance and there is a study being done for the fleet study to see that you know what, what is the best way to manage our fleet that's being done that in the works that um, pretty soon getting get again gonna get started we also are looking for improvements to the building and uh, keeping up with the maintenance of the buildings the HVAC system which is pretty much uh, obsolete and we are uh, replacing that so uh, we can we can have a sound system and uh, and I guess that's pretty much it for the Next slide. Succession planning. You want me to continue, Colleen, or you want? Yeah, yeah, the succession planning and career development plan. This is something that <coughs> Colleen started uh, when she joined RMLD, which is a great plan. Every employee in the organization now, there is a career development plan for them. We want to make sure with all the good plans that we have in the future, our crews, our, uh, our, uh, our most important assets in the organizations, they have the uh, skills necessary to carry us to the future. So everybody has a CDP, career development plan, which is the list of the uh, skills that they need to have to be prepared for the upcoming technology. And uh, they need to meet those uh, in order to, uh, to make sure that you know, they, they make it to the next level. So uh, if you look at on the SharePoint, everybody has and everybody suppose on annually they need to, need to go to see that, you know, what kind of skills they need to add to the set of skills that they already have, and they need to get be trained, the request for training. And that's why you see part of the budget that being presented to you, we have a line item for the training. And uh, we, are, we are very pro-training, and that's going to actually be a cost saving for everybody uh, and avoiding uh, the unnecessary consulting fees and stuff that, you know, well, we How don't like. How uh, has been received? By, by the employees? They like it pretty much because that's, you know, uh, that's uh, incentive for them and that's part of the employee retention plan because, you know, you need to, they everybody, I inc I myself, right. sure. I would love to learn, you know, if I know the organization is providing me the, uh, the uh, 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 opportunity to learn more and to know more about technology and more that I can be more efficient and productive to do my job, you know, that's, that's great. I'll stay in the organization as long as, you know, until I retire. <laughs> so I think it's a very good plan that, and the people, they like it. Uh, now we've started, I guess this year alone, we set up like 15 or 20 training. And some of them, these training, we've been getting them from uh, the manufacturers that, you know, uh, at a very reasonable cost that they come in and they give us the training that you know we need some of them you know we try to bring instructors the best in the field into RMLD we use ECNI we use NEPA and we use the experts in the field to bring them in rather than sending some people out and you know costing us you know seven eight thousand dollars a person to send somebody we bring the instructor in and that way, you know, we could train 10 or 15 people. So. Hey, can we add something to this? Um, I think at the beginning they were a little bit hesitant because um, the program uh, changed it to performance based for step raises. Sure. Um, but as Hamid said, um, we have to identify the skill sets for current and future. Um, some of the. Um, also, as Hamid said, we can look at all of the career developments and see that the same people need the same type of training and bringing people in as opposed to this guy flies to this place right. for three grand or whatever, we've been bringing it in. Um, we found that there was a couple of areas where we were non-compliant, so those have been corrected. Um, you know, for the, like the linemen, for example, um, you know, it's, it's RMLD that certifies the linemen to be journeymen. It's us, we, we certify them. So if you don't have a career development program that makes sure that they understand and have time and grade to learn all of the aspects to become a journeyman, similar to Local 104, 
and you really shouldn't be in a position to be certifying them. So now we have a full certifiable program for both the linemen and the substation technicians. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's a little nerve-wracking at the beginning to, you know, you're making a certain amount of money, you didn't really have to have much training, but we're doing it in such a way that is um, encouraging and it's not t uh, making any of the employees feel like, um, you know, that they don't know something. Right. It's more like, you know, you're going to learn all of this. You're going to be better here. You're going to have a better skill set. And someday when you retire, you'll have more skills mm -hmm. that you can take into your retirement. So I think from that perspective, mm -hmm. it's been well received. Um, it took a while, but it's I would think it would be attractive for uh, for uh, bringing employees in as well. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a, certainly a benefit that you care enough about them to, to want to ensure their training and that's part of a benefit package for for new employees. Sure, I think they love to learn. Well, you can use it to assess from both ways. You're using it for the existing employees, but you also use the same template if you're hiring someone and they fill it out. Now you know where right. on the scale of their skill sets they are. So we've been using it in, in both directions. And um, as Meet said, it's on the SharePoint and you check things out like a library. You check them out, you put them back in. And when we get the dashboards fixed, we'll have a SharePoint uh, that the, the board can have to to be able to access a lot of this information. Okay. Well, and you mentioned there are like random machines, so it, it doesn't sound like it's remedial. So on the one hand, you have training that gets managed as part of your performance management process, and you need this to do your job. Right. If you don't address it, you'll be rated accordingly. And then this sounds more like real development, so it's uh, you know sort of empowering the employee to say, here's skills that you could use now in your future job. So it is mm -hmm. a mix of that. I was wondering. It's a, it's a mix because mm -hmm. now you have the employee is accountable. <coughs> the employee is looking and saying, you know, I want to get that next step. Right. So I want to get this training done. So it might be an in-house training. It might be a number of different things. And he works with the supervisor. I have a responsibility to make sure that they get the training. So we're all working together because we want each of the employees to succeed. We want them to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what the goal is. Does it get rated in their performance review if they don't accomplish it, or is it not meant to be? Well, they wouldn't get their next step raise. Um, okay. If they're in middle management without step raises, we're, we're going in the direction to but create no the steps. So there's no negative consequence, but it is, which I, which I think is more in line with a career plan. So they, if they, if they want to get ahead, this is a template, and this mm -hmm. is how you get to that next step by participating right. in it. In certain jobs, if you don't progress at all, you, you know, you're not able to progress. Right. <laughs> at least not in that sense. <laughs> okay. Great. Yeah. Well, no, I think it's good because I mean uh, the the focus really <coughs> isn't you know isn't meant to be zero or one, but some <coughs> programs are very much remedial and address performance gaps, and this <coughs> this feels a little more like real career development, preparing them for the for their future job or uh, job, so uh, which I think they're, they're good to, I like the, the feel of that. Right. The way I say it to them, I say, well, when we started filling it out, I say, Tom, you won the lottery, so you're leaving tomorrow. So you have to put a list of all your duties that you do down, and then you're gonna correlate them into what training would I need to be able to do that? And then that's done as it becomes more complex and over the years, you know what I mean? Yep. And that's how they, they fill it out and then we review it um, and the managers review it. So, um, you know, and as new technologies or new um, processes get added, we, we upgrade the, um, the career development yep. plan. Can you train us how to do this job so that I can do a better job running the meetings and moving them along? <laughs> <laughs> Are you suggesting? No, I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, anyway, is that anything else on, on the? No, I, I think it's ambitious. The fact that the, the plan being implemented for each employee, that's very ambitious and mm -hmm. permanent. And the last it's thing. Fair. <laughs> yeah, no, but I mean, it's, uh, I think in most companies that's mm -hmm. hard for, yeah. for people to sort of tackle, but I think it's very good. It wasn't easy at the beginning, but it paid off. Yeah. <laughs> And the last thing is that, you know, we are looking into operational policies and procedures and uh, to make sure that, you know, they are reflective of the industry best practices. And uh, 
those are being updated and, and revised as needed. So that's another way of basically uh, to become more efficient and productive. And that, I guess, concludes, is it? Oh, okay. So what's coming next? The organization reliability study recommendations to develop 10 to 20 a year long plan that's going to happen in March. Uh, I guess they're wrapping up the study. Study approximately is about 80% done. And we've been working with them closely, going back and forth to make sure that you know, they stay on the right track, they meet, the, they meet the goals of the study. And then once it's analyzed, and then once they give us the recommendations, basically we're going to make the recommendations to the board, and everybody is going to get a chance to review what needs to be done. And uh, then we're going to put them into five-year plan every year that we submit the budget. And then we're going to implement them until we finish all the recommended uh, uh, solutions or uh, rec recommendations that they make. Yeah. Uh, also, we need to revise the 2008 strategic plan, as Colin said. Usually, every three to five years, these plans, they get updated. And I think it's due for uh, revision or re to be revisited. Uh, so that's another sector that I'm sure Colin is going to be working with the board to make sure that, that we get them updated. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I mean. Yeah, I just would Thank you. suggest uh, that it's probably soon to do it uh, mm. according to the budget process. So when we get to the point of wanting to look at the organizational study output, it might be helpful to have some report prepared for the board to review before coming in. With ease, I think, of the presentation that we're going to take that look at. We were hoping to have some things to hand out, but with the snowstorm, uh, like Lila's was flying in from Texas, and they tried three weeks in a row to get here, so they're <laughs> now coming March 9th. So mm -hmm. we have a number of um, preliminary draft data to go over with them, and then we'll be in a better position to maybe go over the benchmarking and current situation at that time. I doubt it'll snow again. <laughs> Who, knows? Who knows right now? Yeah, the price of oil is going down. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> At this point in time. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. 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 Bill, power supply report. Are we there yet? Do you folks mind if I do it from here? Because I, I don't mind. Right ahead. Ahead. It sounds good. Uh, we were going to go a, a little, do it a little bit different than we normally do it, um, um, and use some visual aids. And just stop me if you have any questions on sections I don't um, highlight. Uh, mainly, what I wanted to highlight on the uh, the metered load portion, which is the the energy first that first paragraph where it says uh, the metered load for the month was sixty one million five ninety nine. 102 kilowatt hours. If you look at this chart here, what this is comparing is fiscal year 2014, which is in the blue, uh, to fiscal year 2015, which is in the red. Uh, most of the blue months are a little bit higher. Uh, we were metering a little bit more load last year, whether that was due to efficiency measures, weather, a combination of both. Um, it looks like s not, not, not a lot of kilowatt hour uh, reduction, but there is some kilowatt hour reduction for the majority of the month. September was pretty, pretty, pretty even for, uh, for both years, as was October. But um, February, I'm pretty confident in saying, is going to come in with the red number being higher than the blue number because we've had a historically uh, cool February. When, when Bob and I, uh, Bob Fournier and I looked at the actuals today, we were almost at last year's level today with two more days to go. So we're looking like it should be about 4 million kilowatt hour hours over what we sold last year. So I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, uh, good news, uh, we're looking right, basically right at where that big hump is in the middle there. Oh, thank you. Um, that's what we had budgeted for for uh, energy purchases for uh, th the winter, and the actual fuel numbers are actually coming in a little bit lower. So, on, on an energy side, that's uh, that's always a good thing to uh, to see. Uh, this.
slide touches basically on table two if you're following on the, re on the report. I just wanted to show you um, where uh, the ISO interchange numbers show up on the overall portfolio. Because um, it's basically at any given time, that piece of the pie is what's out in the spot market. Everything else we have under contract. Um, so um, that's the, the piece of the energy part of our portfolio that would be seeing the spikes if all of a sudden we had a real bad cold snap and prices went up. Uh, so basically in the winter time, around 15% of our portfolio is has the ability to fluctuate. The other parts are pretty much locked in. Um, this is that slide consistent year year after year, or is well, it just this year that, that it's fifteen percent? That, that's an actual fifteen percent of what February look looks like for us. Uh, I'm sorry, January looks like for us for this year. But then, and typically we try to narrow the gaps in the winter time and in the summertime so that we leave less open to the swings in the market uh, and let it get a little bit broader on the shoulder months when it doesn't matter so much. That's the, the goal. Mm -hmm. um, Thank this, you. this slide is a comparison of uh, what we had budgeted uh, for um, capacity costs. And I just am highlighting again, you see this, this uh, larger hump, which is the actual capacity costs. But the reasoning for that is a few months ago we had reported that we had um, transferred our Hyd Hydro-Quebec uh, transmission rates over to Energy New England to market for us. Well, they actually did market the product, and we just haven't seen the capacity payment for January come in yet. So that line is going to go down as soon as the uh, as soon as as soon as the uh, capacity payment comes in, so that the actuals and the budgeted line will be uh, hmm. closer together. Uh, and this, this just sh basically shows our transmission costs for the first six or seven months of the, f of the fiscal year and where the actuals and compared to uh, what we had budgeted. It's basically just lagging by a month from where we had uh, budgeted. So th th no big surprises uh, in transmission costs. So, so on the previous chart, if I may, Bill, we, we actually made money then uh, by having someone else market. Yeah, actually we did. Yeah. It, 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 for at least this year, it, it's going to work out uh, in our favor. Hmm. And then uh, that's all I had for a presentation on uh, the uh, purchase power, unless there's any questions. At some point, I would just love to see um, like a decadal uh, curve of what we're selling and how it's drifted down or is flat. I guess as it goes up with some new developments that get put in, I just would be curious to see a 20-year curve at some point showing what we sell. You know, monthly, uh, I don't know, total monthly sales by, by month for 10 or 20 years. Yeah, we, we have been looking at yeah. that, uh, especially the last 10 to 15 years recently. So we should have you know, a version of that. Just kind of curious what that looks like and, and if there's any way to correct it or to plot um, some. The key, there's a, a number of uh, variables that contribute to it, obviously, but right. some of the major ones are weather. So we're looking into ways to kind of break it down and separate out those different effects. And so can you can see what, what's the weather effect? What's the economic effect? What's right. the fuel charge effect? And, and we're also going to drill down into customer class. Right. Because sure. that, that, that block says, OK, there's less kilowatt kilowatt hour sales, but is that in the commercial sector? Sure. Is it the residential? Is it spread out across all of the classes? We don't know. But just even just a simple curve of, uh, I, that's all great, but I would just love to see what what have we sold over the last 10, 15 years? Just the just the number, the bottom line for the month. Yeah, that's where we started with. This is the yeah. bottom line yeah. trend. So. The, the charts are great, by the way. Yeah, yeah they yeah, are. So much more out of the chart than the numbers. Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, we're going to be doing more of that. Yeah, thank you. I think it, think it makes a much better presentation, much perkier presentation. It yeah. does. Good word there, Phil. Yes. <laughs> we want more perky presentations. Yes. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Well, somebody asked me for chat, so there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> now, Hamid has already given us some perkiness, but maybe there's more coming. Uh, were you done? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, do you have to? Do you Bob wants to go. Hamid's next, but. No, we're going to go with Bob. Either way, whatever. Page 53. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, you had a net loss of negative change in net assets of about $20,000. It decreased that net income to about $2.8 million. <coughs> At the same time, we had year to date budget net income of a little over $2 million, which resulted in net income being over budget by about $750,000 or 36.1%. And the reason why we came in over budget, uh, the Per the budget, the uh, fuel was about two million ex fuel expense was about two million dollars higher than the fuel revenue. But as we all know, at the end of the year, that's a pass through. But it's just the timing of that particular month, so uh, the numbers look a little a little better uh, through the first seven. The actual year-to-date fuel revenues, however, did exceed the fuel expenses by nine hundred sixty-five thousand um, dollars. The revenues, the year-to-date base revenues under budget by $230,000, about 1.7%. The actual base revenues came in at 129 compared to the budget amount of 13.1. I get to use my fresh chart here now, too. <laughs> the visual we have up here is uh, we're showing the budget, which is in the blue. Uh, the re-forecast number shows seven months actual and then five months what we're projecting out uh, the rest of the year to look like. Uh, and as you can see, we're not going to hit our budget numbers, but we're going to come pretty doggone close. Um, and one of the things Colleen has implemented the uh, last several months is we have these monthly meetings where we go over the numbers, and it looks like as we project out uh, for the rest of this fiscal year, uh, we won't hit our budget number right now as it stands, and there's a lot of different factors that can go into that, but we'll still be making over 6% of our possible 8%. But as we look right now, here's where we are at uh, the seven-month uh, level. Mm. Great. On the expenses, uh, page 12A on the financial report, uh, year-to-date purchase power base expenses over budget by $250,000, or about 1.5%. The actual purchase power base cost came in at $17.1 million uh, versus the budgeted cost of about 16.9. On the operating and maintenance side combined, they were over budget by $5,000 or less than a tenth of a percent. Uh, the actual and budget o &M expenses came in at $8.3 million. On my second and last chart, uh, as you can see, the budget is in the blue. And projecting out the rest of this year, too, it looks like we're going to come pretty close to hitting our, our uh, operating o &M expenses. Even though the chart doesn't show that, we had a big uh, uh, decrease in actual expenses compared to the budget. So that big discrepancy between the month of July, even though we exceeded the budget in the preceding months, and you flatten it out and you go through the whole 12, uh, the 12 months fiscal year, we're actually going to come out pretty doggone close to what we had budgeted. There's several factors for that, but as it stands right now, uh, that's how that's going to look. So if you did something like a three-month rolling average, it would actually smooth out a lot of those, right. those peaks and whatnot. Well, we, we actually just picked up the budgeted numbers going forward because we've actually been pretty doggone close. Uh, but July was uh, an anomaly. Some months can sometimes be a little weird right. like that. But the savings we got there uh, compensated for the over budget um, in the uh, su succeeding months. But overall, for 12 months, we should be in good shape. Uh, on page nine, the cash position operating fund is 11.5 million dollars. The capital fund balance is at 5.8 million. Uh, rate stabilization 6.7 million. Deferred fuel a little over 5 million. And the Energy Conservation Fund is at $523,000. On the general information side, the year-to-date kilowatt hour sales, which are found on page 5, came in at $414 million, which is about $3.27 million, uh, or about 1% uh, behind last year's actual figure. So we are closing that gap. Uh, you can attribute that to the cold weather. Uh, good for us, but bad for, you know, bad for us, the consumer, too. But... Uh, we are closing that gap a little bit. Uh, on the budget variance side, cumulatively the five, division, five divisions came under budget by about $20,000 or 
or about two tenths of one percent. So we're in the uh, we're in the middle of the uh, budget season. So we're we're uh, getting the capital and the operating budgets pulled together. They're due the end of next month. Um, Again, the charts are great. Yeah, they really they really give life to this. It's really more impressive. Perky, more perkiness. <laughs> more perkiness. <laughs> yeah. The next report is uh, the engineering operations monthly report. Uh, the first two pages you see the financials for capital improvements, which in month of January spent $101,357, which brings the total year to date for $1,081,740. And then the maintenance programs that I explained in the uh, slides and the presentations, uh, these are basically the activities for the uh, through the month of the to for the January and uh, also part of it through the month of December actually because the January was a slow month in some of the areas we couldn't really do much of the maintenance such as the transformer so the age overloaded uh, transformer replacement through December 31st 2014 for a uh, pad mount transformers and the single phase and three phase categories you see that you know we uh, we replaced approximately 11.36 percent for single phase 6.41 percent for three phase uh, overhead uh, transformer replacement the single phase 8.62 percent and the three phase 3.333 percent replaced the pole testing uh, this year we tested 645 poles in 10 percent of the system and then uh, different coloring system for identification purposes we used 390 got received silver tag which basically they passed the test 233 they failed the test which 21 of them has been replaced the rest are being uh, reevaluated again uh, because some test data were marginal so we can reevaluate them 22 double uh, the, the, the 22 they received double red tag which they were tagged as condemned and they're all been replaced mm -hmm. uh, due to the public safety issues total of 17 of the 43 transfer has has been completed by uh, February 20th 2015 uh, under the, the quarterly inspection uh, you see the list of the circuits that been inspected and we haven't find uh, much of the problems in some areas we s saw some vines that were found that they was uh, yeah, climbing the poles and they they, they, they were uh, trying to reach the uh, cutouts and they were uh, removed from uh, from the base of the poles the manhole inspection is pending, obviously, during the uh, winter months. It's been really h hard to reach the manholes out in the streets and on the sidewalk. So this is on hold until we get better weather conditions. Uh, porcelain cutout replacements, approximately 88% completed. We've got 314 remain to go to finish the program. Uh, under the substation maintenance, the infrared scanning, for that which is being done monthly, we haven't found any new issues. A few were found in earlier months, which we took care of that. Uh, under the substation maintenance program, we still got two breakers that need to be tested, as well as the, the bushing of the 35 kV transformer at the station four that needs to be replaced during the testing. We found those that to be there to be marginally ready to be failed, mm. but uh, it's holding. So uh, we ordered the new parts, and these they're being replaced in April. Uh, so the next uh, part of the report is the system reliability. You see, we're using these indices uh, for the benefit of uh, David, uh, the our new commissioner, and also Mark. Um, the system average interruption duration, these are the two indices basically we use to uh, identify how well the system uh, is doing. One, two are duration <coughs> related and one is frequency related. The duration ones, they are system average interruption duration and customer average interruption duration index and the frequency related is system average interruption frequency index. As you could see, they're all, we compare them against the national and the regional average and they're all pretty much for 
the custom average interruption duration, uh, system average interruption duration were well below the national and regional average, which means we are doing well compared to other systems in uh, durations and outages. The system average interruption frequency index for 2014, you could see that there is a spike. Then we've got to go a little bit above uh, their regional average because we've had too many pole hits uh, that, you know, the, 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 the in various communities. But for the month of January, as you could see, pretty much in uh, across the board, we are doing very well. We haven't had any uh, pole hit. Obviously, the snow banks, they've been helping, you know, <laughs> <laughs> protecting. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> They're helping something. <laughs> right. Yeah, so the, good, the, good <laughs> the only positive benefit. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why my number for system <laughs> average <laughs> interruption <laughs> frequency is zero. And system average interruption frequency and the customer average interruption duration. Basically, we haven't had much uh, much of mm. the outages to report, so that's why we're doing it. But those numbers they go up as we, you know, every month as we're getting closer to the uh, spring and summer. And uh, the next page you see the reliability report for the cause of the outages. Basically, we had a uh, total of four outage related, uh, that the 50% were equipment related, 50% they're tree related, uh, and the chart in the bottom, bottom shows the average of the last five years, five to six years, where has been the major problem with the, the contributing factors to the outages, which 28% trees, Wildlife been 424 percent and equipment approximately 36 percent, and these are the equipment that the transformers they could uh, either failed or uh, you or the maybe cutouts that the porcelain cutouts that we addressing those. So all of those maintenance related issue should cut down these the numbers for the equipment for the trees and hopefully uh, once. We, we we implement uh, these these are in full uh, these are the we we get making more progress with the maintenance. Uh, you're gonna see these numbers shrinking. I'm surprised about the wildlife number. What what is that? These are the squirrels and you know the animal contact that you know well we have them uh, during the uh, spring, fall, and summer. You know we've had lots of squirrel contacts. Believe it or not. We got animal lifeguards for the for the devices that we put them on, uh, but um, somehow they managed to you know to <coughs> chew them, get into them. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. Yeah. They have their own training. Yeah. Yeah. Coley's <laughs> 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 totally been providing training yeah. for the squirrels. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah. need to reprimand them. But <laughs> 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 underground pool and I mean that's a pool uh, you have an uh, underground pool uh, 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 oh in ground in ground in ground apparently it happens in uh, like the international in the oceans as well and that cable has to be protected against uh, like sharks and other animals. Here was nine, nine on the table. Wow. I mean, it's just, I don't know what drives them to do that, but. <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right. Any questions? No. Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Amir. Thank you. items yeah I guess we're all set we don't need to go discuss the other we have a couple of um, like uh, board review dates for um, the budget I did email um, tab chairman uh, George Hooper and ask him if we could combine he prefers not so um, attempt to uh, limit the amount of meetings but so we need to have mm. the budget meetings and then um, ask him for a policy review committee meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to notify you that both Mead and I would not be at the March 26th. Um, we're both um, 
vacation is Should we reschedule? Day. Let's reschedule the meeting then, shouldn't we? Um, I don't mind, but the label sticks there after the vacation. Well, I know, but if, if the general manager isn't going to be here, it's, it makes it a little well, tougher. Jane, Jane will be actually <coughs> running the meeting. We'll still have. Um, okay. Yeah. And we can actually have Peter Price to the uh, operations. Fine. Right. Let's Good. do okay. that. Let's fine. do that. I Thanks. think I think that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. we want we're going to get the budget done right. before we go on vacation, so okay. that's um, right. I think that's fine. Hmm. Yeah. All right then. Um, so we're all set. We have the next meeting is Thursday, March twenty sixth, and uh, Thursday, April thirtieth, and cab meetings Wednesday, March eleventh. How and soon then are you going to need the budget meeting? The uh, policy the policy committee, committee meeting. Should we uh, coordinate that? So I think you and I are on that right board, right? So right, yep. should we coordinate that with? Eugenie, in terms of finding I think the time. Was it the fourth? Or I think so. Yeah. Something three. Tom okay. Is on the Sorry, Tom. Yep. And how soon are you going to need that? My time is kind of limited these days. <laughs> What's more important, Phil? <laughs> 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 well, <laughs> <we're> <laughs> 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 you want to do it by conference? Can we conference in on it for discussion? Is that if we do it, in, you know, I, I, if we can do it in the morning like we did before. Yeah. I think that's, that's fine. You know, that's fine. Us to do, do, do I can, yeah. you know, I can roll out of bed and I get here. I think what so you close. were saying, Nancy, every meeting should be discussed in the morning for some reason. The budget meeting should be done. So what? Uh, what's the best process, Gene? If we do it in between meetings, or is it? Uh, I, I can't think of good um, Tuesday for the discussion of that. I'd have to look at the joint schedule. That's most the most. Important that's what we're more urgent, the policy meeting or the mm -hmm. budget meeting? Mm -hmm. the policy. So, uh, Phil, why don't you tell us which morning it works best for you, and then Tom and I can... Um, uh, really, uh, the... I don't think I've got anything on the 5th. I don't think I've got anything scheduled on the 5th. Let me check. Yeah. What do we so need, about an hour? Yeah. yeah. And then the budget meeting was in April. Right now, I've got nothing scheduled on the, on the 5th of March. Nothing on that on that day. Mm. Yeah, I mean, as long as it's not a several hour meeting, I'm okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, what, well, what time do you need me there? I have a, I do have an 8.30 meeting with Ruben. You got to meet an hour, so should we leave at 7.30? 7.30 is okay with me. Yeah. 7.30 is fine with me. On the 5th? Yep. yep. I don't need to be at that one then. You, you're always welcome. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> or if you can make it 6.30. I mean, let's not go too far. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we still need to do two budget meetings. Yeah. What's the, what, when do those have to happen? April. Yeah, let's do it that way. It's fine. So we're set? Good. Okay. All right, can we ad adjourn to go into executive session? All right. Ready for that? Yep. Okay. I'll move the board going into executive session to approve the executive session meeting minutes of October 2nd, 2014, and return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Yep. All right. Aye. 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 Pull the board. Pull the board. Um, Ms. Bassino, aye. Mm -hmm. Mr. Talbot, aye. Mr. Stempak, aye. Mr. Hennessy, aye. Mr. O'Rourke, aye. I said, Mr. O'Rock. <laughs> guess that's it. I'm sorry for the length of the meeting, everybody. <laughs> Mr. Tom O'Rourke. Right. Right, thanks, go. guys. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Good, uh, sorry good, good I keep stuff. you so long. It was Literally great stuff. Yeah. What are you looking at, sir?